Alright you blessedly miserable accursed, welcome to the curse of politics, the only political strategy pod that puts the cuss in disgust while giving you the straight goods from people who've made a living in the meeting after the meeting. Scott Reed and Corey Tonight are here with me today. Do not fret, you dip or accursed, Jordan Likeness will be back with her insightful takes and to fact check Corey on the NDP record next week. Let's get right into it. Guns, rifles and shotguns and the government climbed down on them. What changed in a few months time and how will it play politically now for the Liberals? Trudeau sits down with the Premiers this week in pursuit of a new health care deal. What's it going to look like? How will it differ? What are the politics behind it all? Our cursed clipping is Chantal Hebert's piece in the Star on Trudeau's appointment of Amira El Gawabi and what it's doing to his political future in his home province. That seeks nicely into the latest abacus poll results, an eight-point lead for Polyev and the CPC. And then I'll invite Mr. Pinson to put a merciful end to the chaos with our hey yous. Do you, you think know, Gordon you got- Pinson listens to us? Absolutely. Like if we if we bumped he wants into to make Gordon, sure we're not misusing him. Like if we bumped into Gordon Pinson at a piano bar, would he wander over to us with a glass full of ice and whiskey and say, "Gentlemen, it's a pleasure." He would say, "Gentlemen, it's time for the hey use." I I think he'd come and ask for a royalty check or something, wouldn't he? <laughs> no, he gave this up freely. It's amazing. Amazing. Wow. Uh, the Premier of Newfoundland thought it was really the only reason to listen to the show. Um, Newfoundland voice. So listen, we got another day here without Jordan. I don't know how she can possibly stand to be on a beach with a rum drink, missing all the daily ins and outs of Canadian politics. What is the government proposing? What is the government retracting? What is Polyev angry about? What is Jugmeet on about? How can she miss all that? I feel for her. She literally sent us a photograph of herself with sand on her face. That's yeah. how much she's enjoying her day. She's yeah. talking about surfing and drinking beer, but there was there was sand on her face. Like yeah, she had just rolled around. It's better than our lives. Surely she doesn't surf. That would make me feel terribly inadequate. I think she said she was surfing. Yeah, I, I think know. she said she was. Jesus. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, let's get on to it then. Let's start with guns, you guys. On Friday, the Liberals withdrew their changes to gun control legislation that would have banned assault weapons, but ended up including a bunch of rifles generally used in hunting. Even the AFN was angry about it. After months of denying the problem and then attempting to smooth it through consultations, the government capitulated on Friday, withdrew them entirely. Now, Corey, Dalton McGinty is quoted as saying that there's never a bad time to do the right thing. But surely he would agree that sooner is better than later. Yeah, I think so. I actually think it's a great example of why uh, people in in government should be listening to this podcast. Because if they'd listened to you (laughs) right when this very began, David, they would have known it was time to back off and that this was an overreach. Uh, I think it's been an overreach for a long time, but... I also am a little bit perplexed by it, though, because I think it's been a very good wedge issue for them. Um, And, uh, you know, I think if they hadn't just reached that little bit further into territory where I think that they were at risk of losing the support of the NDP, I think it would have worked really well for them. Um, Because I don't think they're getting any votes in rural parts of the country where uh, where guns are part of a way of life. Uh, And uh, uh, I think it's a good wedge issue for them in in the suburbs. So... Uh, anyway, it's a, it's, it's a self-inflicted uh, wound here, and uh, uh, I don't think it's a fatal one or anything, but it's, uh, it's definitely a big oops. Hey guys. Scott, you know, I mean, I, I, don't know that it's a, I don't know that it's a big deal. Corey's analysis is right. I mean, whatever damage happens in rural Canada and among hunters is unlikely to affect the liberal vote very much. But is there a broader problem when people are so heavily focused on what's going on in their lives, particularly financially, also the healthcare system, but particularly financially, and people think things are stressed and that fundamental things in the country aren't working, and we can talk about that a little bit, to be talking about something that people think is probably beside the point and to be seen to be focused on something that's probably beside the point. Um, I don't know that it's beside the point. I think it's... Uh, just uh, guys, lean in. Okay, I think this was. 
I think this was off target. I think they missed the bullseye. I think they shot themselves <laughs> in the foot. I got a hundred of them. Okay. I'm at a dog. I'm, I'm at a Dean Martin Rose chair. Ah, I'd like to thank the Puerto Rican gentleman for the introduction. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I think there's an element of it. I wonder if the retreat is explained in part by a, a broader effort uh, to clean their desk a little. Um, and say, let's, let's stop doing things that cause us, uh, headaches. Um, let's make certain that we're concentrating on, uh, a core set of issues that have a little bit more, um, uh, traction with people. Like, I, I don't think the gun control is a marginal issue. I do think it has political benefit. I do think if you want to be crass about it, it has lots of wedge opportunity and, and, and value in it. I do think that, the, you know, execution is nine-tenths of the law, and they screwed up the execution. So, you know, if you're going to use the list of firearms as your mechanism to drive this wedge, then you'd better make certain that is a good list. What's it emblematic of? I think it is emblematic of something about this government that I've detected over the years, and it is that there's a lot of half-assery in terms of the way the bureaucracy sometimes is ridden you know like hey guys have we got the right list is this disciplined has this been checked and double checked have we actually been rigorous in it i just find sometimes that you know when you would talk to people within the government it feels like a lot of the times they'll sort of say well we want this and then you know like the challenge function within the bureaucracy i don't think exists as, as greatly i think the challenge function from the political level into the bureaucracy saying hey guys wait a second is this the best like these three options at the bottom of the memo, are these the right three options? Could we have four other options, three different options? I just sense that there's sometimes a um, a lack of, of rigor there. Um, and politically, you know, I think if they were going to retreat on this, they should have retreated in December. You remember that strange news conference they had about a week prior to Christmas where they, they it felt like they were about to say, and therefore were redoing the list or were withdrawing the list in the amendment, but they didn't. They just kind of said, yeah, you know, we kind of like just wanted to get together here and say to you that we hear you. We know what we've done is inexact. Um, so we'll see you on the other side of the holidays. Like there was no end. And it was like, and, and what are you doing? And the reason this did die, just so you know, it wasn't seeming like the NDP were going like they, this got pulled I'm told explicitly because the NDP went to them and said, guys, the gig is up. We're not supporting this in, 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 in committee. So fucking get rid of it or you lose the bill. It's just that simple. And there's lots of talk about, well, maybe we'll come back. And you heard people hinting about this. Can I stop you? Why yeah. the fuck wouldn't the NDP take credit for that? Like, I don't know that. Why didn't Jagmeet Singh uh, blast it's that out there? Because it's a divided issue within their caucus, right. right? You know, obviously, right? So they, they're, 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 it cuts both ways for them in terms of their voter coalition, which is not so much stitched together as all, you know, a couple of independent islands that they occasionally try to, you know, ferry between. Uh, I just, it, you know, I look at it and it just, it's kind of frustrating from my perspective because I do think it's a good, strong political issue. I do think it's an important issue. I don't think it's tangential to people's concerns. But A, the liberals often think that gun control is a substitute for being tough on crime. And those things are additive, you know, not 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 exclusive. Um, I do think that they got the particulars wrong and that meant that they had to retreat. And that's unnecessary. That's just that's just sloppiness. Um, I think the department let down the minister. And I think the minister, to be honest, who's a friend of mine, should have made different judgments earlier on this thing to, to, to boot this thing. And now... Um, now there's talk that they might try to reintroduce. Like if you said, they're openly saying, well, it might not be the end of the day. We may come back with more amendments that'll up. And it's like, are you sure you want to return, pun intended, to the scene of the crime? Like, you know, because if you're going well, to come back. Well, they kind of have to if they want to use it as a wedge again. They've got to find a wedge they can use on this on this issue. So, you know, maybe park a, it. a tighter I would list. I would park it or let the NDP introduce a new list of committee. Uh, but that list has got to be, again, more puns, bulletproof. And then finally, like, uh, you know, they've got to get on bail reform. And so, you know, Corey and I were talking on question yeah. period yesterday. From my perspective, one, that list was shitty and somebody should be rattling cages 
at, at the department about that too. If they want to move on bail reform, you guys know what it's like. We've both been there and had these discussions. You worked with the Department of Justice, David. You're a, a former comms director, PMO staffer, uh, Corey. You know damn well the Department of Justice is 100% institutionally opposed to bail reform. And so when the minister says he's open to it, he means like, I am working night and day to drag by the lapels my department there. And they're going to have to get to that because they don't have a response I remember to the crime when, issue when, without it. When, when Anne McClellan was uh, replacing the Young Offenders Act, which was in great dispute, uh, great disrepute in the country because it was seen as just giving slap on the wrist to people that were, in fact, sometimes dangerous offenders, um, with something called the Youth Criminal Justice Act, which really wasn't that substantial a change other than the name, which sounded tougher on it. But the department was so opposed, I witnessed Michael Brown, the chief of staff to Adam McClellan, back in the days when everything was on a floppy disk, demanding that George Thompson, the DM, give him the disk of the final version of the uh, of the act so that he could make sure that, uh, that the name <laughs> was correct and that all the details were right and that they'd actually done it because they were so opposed to those changes. Utterly. By the way, Michael Brown, superior, superior court judge now? I think he's like the, he's, he's the chair of the, like he's the senior judge? He's a big deal, as he should. He's a big deal, as man. As he should be, yeah. And unlike the rest of us, who time just passed by, you know? Yeah. We're here we're in our basements talking on a podcast. I'm gonna- so if we're thinking about quintessential Canadian imagery, I'm betting the kayak pops into your brain pretty quickly. Kayaks were originally developed by the Inuit, Yupik, and Aleut peoples. Designed for amazing buoyancy and maneuverability, they used them to hunt on lakes, rivers, and the coastal waters of the Arctic Ocean, North Atlantic, Bering Sea, and North Pacific. Today, for most, they're more of a recreational vehicle, eh? I have one myself. Count me as a personal testament to a kayak's buoyancy, hurly burlyites. I've been telling stories here the last little while about our presenting sponsor, TELUS's cultural commitment to network resilience and reliability. From investing billions of dollars to build differently than their competitors, to their network technicians and field teams pulling out all the stops to keep people connected in the most challenging conditions. In this week's story, the kayak looms large and sleek and narrow. Here's what I mean. The indigenous word Gixon means people of the river mist. In the earliest days of last summer, during a violent storm in the Gixon territory of northwestern BC, a massive tree collapsed and submerged vital TELUS fiber optic cables near the bottom of the Kispiox River, cutting off connectivity to the remote community. Five TELUS team members in two kayaks and one helicopter were dispatched immediately. Working tirelessly, maneuvering on a strong current from the cockpit of the two craft, they were able to haul up and repair the cables, restoring essential power, phone services, and connectivity to the region. For TELUS, Resilience and reliability is often about billion-dollar investments in operations and cutting-edge technology. And sometimes, it's just about good people and a couple of kayaks. Both are ultimately about how we connect with one another. More next week. Isn't it uh, a good thing for them to just set aside uh, for another reason, too? That I think the environment's really shifted here uh, in terms of the crime issue. It's, It's obviously surging in the polls uh, uh, for a number of reasons. We've talked about this a little bit before, uh, but the solutions yet offer have to have some relationship to the problems that are in people's minds. And if the problem is violence on the subway, but it's not gun crime, uh, and it's carjackings and car thefts and Peel region and other, other places, <clears throat> you gotta, you gotta do something. that looks like you're, you're addressing the, those things. And, uh, you know, as you guys have pointed out before, the, the firearms issue is more of a values issue than it is a crime one. It's about uh, uh, it's it's more about that. And the people who think there should be more gun control actually think there should be no guns, period. Uh, sometimes not even with the uh, with the police. Like there's uh, a, a lot of uh, oh, it's a bit uh, of a, a generalization. Of- I'm for gun control, but not against guns. Uh, well, I, I think if you're looking at who is the most passionate about this stuff, it's it, it's uh, it, that's more the, the I think that's more accurate what I'm saying than what you're saying. You're an anomaly, just like me. You're an urban guy now, but you you know you grew up in an area that uh, where hunting and those things were were a part of uh, of your environment. Uh, but 
uh, we're the outliers. We're not uh, we're not the standard fare. If you're talking I, to, a I prefer the 35. word exceptional. Yeah. Okay. Exceptional. <laughs> Well, yeah, okay, we're exceptional. We can't, neither of us can surf like Jordan, but well, okay, we're, we're exceptional in other ways. Right. So, I mean, it is, when, when, I, when it's been used effectively as a issue in elections, its wedge really is on values. And so um, it, it is used to distinguish the conservatives from what is, what the mainstream of Canadian thought is. And it's, it, it, it accentuates the fact that people think they might be out of the mainstream in a number of different ways. And this is, this is just one, one instance of it. But as an issue of its own, it's like the 15th most important issue that somebody would vote on. And if they vote on it, it's because like in 2019, there was nothing to distinguish on the first 14 issues. But it's not a big issue if there's other issues going on. Right. Especially if there's a if there are big crime issues going on, like because it, although it's a values issue, it is it certainly lives adjacent to 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 crime and perceptions around crime. Uh, that's why if you know there's a mass shooting or there's a you know a, a outbreak of uh, gun violence between gang members that that it drives up in in the issue matrix. But you know crime's going up, but it's not gun crime. So uh, I think uh, you know, if. Uh, uh, if the minister is uh, is listening right now, he should be thinking about what he does on on bail reform and some other things. Because uh, you got you got to get on target. Uh, to you, use Scott's over overworked analogy. Here. Um, <laughs> do you know where they can't put emphasis on the border? I mean, that is where the best politics on handguns would be now. Yeah, I mean, this and, thing and started out is. as a fundamentally a handgun bill. And, and grew into this monstrosity that had to be withdrawn. But, you know what, really, when it comes to gun control, people don't think that the guns that exist in Canada are the primary problem being used in criminal activity in our cities. They think those guns are imported. Well, because they're right about that. Like, it's, you know, I, we're talking about the politics being good for the Liberals. The policy is abhorrent. Like, it's it's just more demagoguery and bullshit. Uh, it's not I don't actually know about that. what's... Aren't, but why aren't wouldn't, they have, big, aren't, why wouldn't they have a big border thing? Why can't we have look, a big look, look, fucking block them at look, the border look, policy? Look at all the data that we do have on guns that are used in crime, and they're largely imported. Because, and, and, and the ones that aren't, nobody's fucking registering them. Because guess what? Even the stupidest criminal, criminal is not so fucking stupid as to go and register a firearm and then use that in the commission of a crime. Like, it's just not actually what's going on. But, you know, well, as, a values, as a values wedge... It's great as a, a policy to reduce crime. It's shitty, but you know, it's this is this issue has always been about politics and never about policy, in my view. Well, I'd, uh, one, I would definitely, um, I would definitely have a loud and vigorous narrative uh, and set of initiatives around border because I do think it's a legitimate issue, and I think it's a point of anxiety and public distress. So it just seems smart to be louder and more present on that. Uh, similarly, I think when it comes to crime and the and and its and its relevance, particularly uh, in urban Canada, particularly in the GTA, I think you got to be talking about bail reform, and I think the government's got to have to get real on that. I think the only thing I would say on the on this on the policy uh, around this is, you know, a lot of violence does occur, particularly domestic violence with guns that are already in someone's possession. Somebody doesn't actually lock up their gun or somebody does take that gun and then they use it, you know, uh, because it's available so that it ends up in domestic abuse. So it isn't solely just like, you know, um, you know, like kind of imaginary te television inspired gangsters going across the border. But, you know, I, I really think for the government, they got to be there's a big strategic judgment they have to make about whether or not to reintroduce amendments and come up with another list. Because I will guarantee you one fucking thing. If they have a new list, yes, it will be smaller than the list they had. But also, it will be imperfect. Because you can't do a top 10 list of Elton John's best songs without people going fucking sneaky, much less the top 10 list of like, here's the guns I'm going to take from you. Like, they're not going to be able to introduce it and have people go, oh, well, they listened. Oh, now yeah. I'm happy with this list. Like, that isn't going to happen. So well, let, having let's taken with, the political... Let's start with getting Carrie Price's gun off the list. <laughs> right. But once, you, <laughs> once you've taken... The, like, uh, to me, what's puzzling is like, once you've taken the the political decision that you're going to retreat, 
um, why charge again? And then, you know, like I know they think that elections far off. And so maybe they're just like, well, we want to complete our legislative agenda on this. But I, I think politically there's risk in submitting a new list and new set of amendments and kind of, you know, like saying, geez, let's go back like the coyote to the Acme uh, cannonball and say, let's see if it explodes this time. My guess is it will explode again. <laughs> I want to talk for a moment about government regulation, something we have a fair amount of in Canada. It's complicated. There's general agreement that governments should not try to oversee and manage the economy, but there's also a natural urge to demand that governments step in when problems hit home. Supply chains are a good example. Our sponsor, CN, is perhaps the most vital link in Canada's supply chains, because just about everything moves by train. And supply chains have been gummed up worldwide for years now. War and the pandemic and changing weather have caused disruptions, which have caused shortages, which have in turn caused inflation and even higher interest rates. It's affected just about everybody. Inevitably, there have been suggestions that the solution lies with more government and more regulation, expanding the power of agencies to intervene, for example, and to exert more control over supply chain participants to perhaps oblige railways to accept and manage more of each other's cargo, trading it back and forth across the country, or forcing transportation companies to prioritize one industry's products over another. CN would respectfully suggest that our supply chain participants know their jobs better than anyone, and that more regulation would more than likely increase costs, dampen investment, and dilute service. And it says that as a railway that has moved record amounts of grain out of the prairies to domestic and foreign markets in recent months. The fact is, every link in the supply chain is at the mercy of all the other links. Manufacturers, railways, shippers, truckers, ocean-going ships, and government terminals, to name several. And the only way our domestic supply chains will operate at maximum capacity is for all the players to coordinate transparently, collaboratively, and constantly. CN pledges to do just that. It is utterly committed to moving cargo and delivering it on time. All right, let's move on. Uh, we return for our cursed clipping yet again to Chantal Hébert, such a talented writer, writing about the appointment of a special representative to combat Islamophobia. The appointment has been slammed in official Quebec for comments she's made in the past about Quebec attitudes toward Islam and about Quebecers overstating the impact of colonialization on them historically. Much of the Quebec caucus, including ministers, were distancing themselves from the appointment, but the PM has steadfastly depended her and the appointment. Here's what Chantal Hébert says. Moving on to Trudeau, he and his liberals have been just been on the receiving end of the biggest Quebec backlash of his tenure as prime minister. By all available indications, the Prime Minister was only aware of some of El Gawabi's musings about Quebec prior to her appointment. He may not have been briefed about the vomit tweet. It sometimes seems the due diligence approach of this Prime Minister's office to the vetting of high-profile appointments is to dismiss potentially inconvenient facts rather than dig into them. On that score, the most glaring example remains Julie Payette's elevation to the role of Governor General. In this case, the tendency seems to have been compounded by a serious PMO disconnect from Quebec. If there is someone on Trudeau's staff with a solid Quebec antenna and the influence to draw attention to red flags, he or she must have taken January off. Corey, the Liberals are competitive with the Conservatives nationally in part because of strong support in Quebec, so this seems mm -hmm. dangerous to me. Yeah, well, I think it's the biggest upshot of, of the polling, and I know we're going to be <clears throat> talking a little bit more of that uh, about uh, that, particularly the abacus poll, um, uh, as we move through this topic, but uh, that's where their biggest vulnerability is. And and Scott, you know, you've brought this up many times when we're chatting about this. Like, there is no uh, Trudeau government without strong support in Quebec, and I think they're kind of pissing it away on a bunch of issues that make no sense to me. Like like this, they all seem to be these sorts of uh, you know values issues that they've been. Uh, being quite aggressive about the notwithstanding clause, section 33, talking about that, which which puzzles me greatly as we talked about last week, because like I just don't I don't get why you would bring it up now. Like it's not like there's anything that's changed. Uh, but uh, it's I think it's tone deaf. I think it's picking a fight where they don't need to pick one. And and as uh, Chantal points out, it's it's just demonstrating a lack of rigor in terms of appointments, which is which is not. You know, limited to this government. I've, you know, every government seems to 
to, to not do with the, the correct amount of checking on appointments sometimes. <laughs> this one's no ex, uh, no exception. Although the Julie Payette stuff is is uh, probably the worst example I can think of, uh, save one, which was uh, when the Harper government appointed to the head of uh, the Sur uh, Security and Intelligence Review Committee, someone who, uh, if you'd done a Google search, would have seen was uh, convicted of fraud in Detroit, you know, not yeah. that long before. Um, <clears throat> but you know, it's it's uh, it just is is puzzling to me. But I think they're they're on the cusp of having a real problem uh, in Quebec. Uh, the bloc said nine points nationally, and and some of the polling that's that is danger territory. Scott, what do you think? Well, first of all, as a woman of color from francophone speaking Quebec, <laughs> I have all the authority in the world to wax about this issue um, no. and scold everyone. Uh, for what they think and what they've said. Uh, what do I think? I think that it's, um, I think when you make this appointment, I don't know how much due diligence was done. I know that Chantal Hébert has been writing columns for 45 years saying that the PMO, and it doesn't matter who's PMO, lacks a straight Quebec antenna. That is just like, that's a perpetual thing. Maybe she's been right for 45 years, but that is a fucking standard uh, concern and complaint. Um you could not do due diligence without saying to yourself, this is going to kick the hornet's nest uh, in Quebec. This goes straight at, the, this is the McLean's magazine, all Quebec politicians are corrupt, like, equip, like this is the same zone. This goes right at the soft spot of uh, Quebec political elites, uh, insecurity right you're just going you're treading right into it right the generalization that they're you know that they're tribal that they're nativists that you know they're racist if you want to go as heavy as that um and so you know i i don't understand why this appointment was made um and that's not a critique of this woman and i've watched why this, this appointment was made or why this position was created um both are May worth thinking about. Aren't either they? both are worth thinking about. Certainly, the appointment itself, be given the the ease with which you could see phrases that you know are generalizations that will be impossible to defend, and in fact that she's had to go and sit and go through the humiliation of fucking sitting down with you know Blanchette and apologizing to his face, and then have to sit and tolerate him going, well, it's not good enough. Uh, so you know that you know at minimum her appointment, but you know I just. I don't know if it's a lack of due diligence, but it does not feel like this was deliberate. I think on the notwithstanding clause, there's been a there's been a running debate about that. I think there's a deliberateness to what Trudeau has and hasn't said on that. I think this felt like it was a stumble. It, it was something they wandered into and then went, holy shit, there's grenades going off all around us. So maybe that exactly validates Chantel's point. Um, but it's uh, I think it's problematic because I don't think there's the, one shortcut to having a big problem in Quebec is that you sort of violate the fundamental cultural insecurities of the body politic there. And that's what's happened. And so now, like, it's, it's you know, they need time to repair. Listen, I know that Chantel has said that about previous PMOs, including <laughs> Paul Martins. So let's, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be critical, but we're going to a Dennis Dawson's retirement party from the Senate this week. And <laughs> As Dennis would say, the eternal question in Quebec is, who's the top frog in Ottawa? Who is the top frog in Ottawa? Well, Trudeau. Well, it doesn't usually count, but is that is that the answer? Is he the guy that is supposed to have the political antenna about this appointment? Or is somebody well, else in the PMO or elsewhere supposed to do that? Well, I don't want to scoop my hey use, but I got something to say on that later. But... Uh, look, uh, I listened to his remarks, Trudeau's remarks. Uh, I think he was going into a caucus meeting or something uh, this past week uh, where he was going on and on about basically this topic area and, and whether or not uh, Quebec is racist or not. And he was just talking in circles. And I just, for the life of me, could not understand why he would uh, be going down this road and having this conversation right now, where it leads, who he's trying to impress, who he's trying to convince, because if he was impressing anyone or convincing anyone, he certainly wasn't in those remarks that I listened to. It just, uh, it sounded like 
kind of bizarre and kind of self-indulgent and very undisciplined. Like, so I just, I don't get it. I don't get why he's talking about this unless his objective is to put wind in the sails of the BQ. Cause that seems to be about the only thing that's actually happening. And, uh, uh, by taking this course of action. It's hard to see a liberal, very difficult to see a liberal government after the next election that doesn't include 40 seats from Quebec. I completely agree. Yeah. I just yeah. don't think, uh, you can have strong opinions about what's right, what's wrong. By God, I'm not going to do this or compromise in that way or this way. Um, but there is a pressing political fact that you can't escape, and it is the one you just stated, David. And everything that they do that is going to significantly affect or introduce risk for them in Quebec has to be like 100% measured, remeasured, thought through, uh, and discussed. You can't just stumble into the shit like this. It's too dangerous. So if you're a long-term or even medium-term planner, you tend to want to make sure you have enough of the really vital stuff in life, well, before you run out of it. Regular listeners can guess what that stuff would be for me. Hint, it starts with an R and ends with an M, and there's only one other letter. For Canada, shipping container capacity qualifies as really vital stuff as many of the goods we all rely on move in and out of the country in containers. Our sponsor is the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, and we've been talking the last little while about how they're proposing to build a brand new marine terminal for shipping containers at the Port of Vancouver, Roberts Bank Terminal 2. Because container capacity on the West Coast is quickly diminishing, because trade needs are only growing in Canada, and the Port of Vancouver is a critical gateway for Canada's trade because it will strengthen the link between our country's businesses, big and small, and the global economy, because the economic impact will be 17,300 well-paying jobs and $3 billion in additional GDP annually during terminal operations. And because frankly, we've all had it up to here with supply chain issues, so scaling up right away will help connect Canadians with goods when they need them. But there's another key aspect to the long-term planning of this critical port project for Canada I want to talk about. The Vancouver Fraser Port Authority's vision is for the Port of Vancouver to be the world's most sustainable port. And one way they're focusing on meeting that vision is by working with all their partners to build a zero emission port by 2050. You heard me right, the entire port community. Building and supporting low emission tech initiatives in an effort to phase out all port related emissions by 2050 is part of that vision and supports the government's goal to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. The Vancouver Fraser Port Authority has a proven track record of building sustainable infrastructure projects, all while being a trusted partner of government, business, indigenous groups and local communities to get the job done. Well, but also on the comms side, you don't have to say every thought that passes your through your mind. Like, uh, like w what is the purpose of what you're trying to communicate? Like, it's you know just musing on various things and 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 spouting them off into microphones. That's 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 amateur hour. That's not what you do in politics. You have to have a message and have some discipline around these things. Have a purpose. Have something that you're you know you're taking people to. And I just don't see where all of this is going, which comes back to so, why so, would you create this position in the first place? Like, what, okay, Corey, what's, so what's, it gonna, what's there to do? Corey, do you think they thought it was a micro target appeal that would go under the radar for the vast majority of Canadians, but be strongly appealing to the people whom it was tended to uh, address? And then it blew, and then it became a national, and then it became a national thing, and uh, it becomes more difficult to defend. Yeah, well, uh, it seemed like Pablo Rodriguez was pretty surprised. So you know, when when your Quebec yeah. lieutenant uh, doesn't see it coming, I, it's hard to to infer that there's a lot of strategy and forethought in it. It looks it's, a lot more like amateurism and and you know bumbling idiocy to me. But yeah. uh, like uh, you know, who, who thought this was a good idea? I just uh, right. I don't get it. Like you know, and and insofar as uh, this is a good person to appoint, etc. Who are they convincing? You know, uh, you know, it just seems like uh, you know, kind of hectoring in in nature, and I, I don't think that ever convinces anyone. There's a mechanical right. issue here that you've come 
really close to, I just want to call it even more explicit. Pablo clearly looked surprised. And it wasn't a politician saying, oh, this is a bonfire now, I'm going to back away from it. He clearly was like, I don't know fuck all about this or how this happened. All I know is that it is now causing me pain and I'm unhappy about that. And so mechanically, you have to work backwards and say, well, how could an appointment of this kind with this potential Right. For like, I mean, if you're going to decide you're going to do it and put up with the grief, okay, fine. But you can't walk blindly into it. It appears as though they walk blindly into it. How does your Quebec lieutenant not sign off on an appointment of that sort? How does uh, mechanically within the apparatus of who gets to weigh in on these things? Um, I mean, their appointments process is, you know, slower than Haley's Comet, right? Comes by every 82 years or whatever. Like, (laughs) surely to Christ. They could have built in one more layer of review. Um, you can't have your Quebec lieutenant caught off guard. Well, 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 isn't that what half the job a Quebec lieutenant is? So doling out patronage and, and reviewing these sorts of things? Like No question. Um, and going back to the Modi Anglais like me and going, Reed, what the fuck are you thinking? This is no good. Sorry. I'm mm-hmm. just telling you right now. I'm, using, I'm getting out my Quebec veto and I'm stamping don't. it on this stupid piece of paper you just handed me. Yeah. What they were saying to us, Scott, is don't call the Gomery Inquiry. That's true. Uh, that's what they were saying to us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I, we'll have a dedicated 10th anniversary podcast about that sometime. Uh, our 10th you, you anniversary. Didn't, you didn't need to go to Quebec to get that advice. You just needed to call me. I would have told you the same thing. Yeah. I have a oh, different man. View. We are going to have to talk about that sometime. Uh, all right, so uh, back to the health care well for the umpteenth week in a row, but this week something's going to happen one way or another, yeah. and I'm damn confused about it, and I'm looking to you gentlemen to help clarify this for me. Corey, you first. What so, kind of accord are we getting? What's going to happen <laughs> on wait, Tuesday? let me ask this question. Oh, Jesus. Mister, I'm in charge of the podcast. I ask the questions. Well, I don't want to answer them, so I do like to ask them. Uh, nothing makes sense to me about this meeting. Everybody's acting as if there's a deal, yet they say there's no deal. But everybody's acting as if there is a deal. The provinces don't seem to be yelling about the fact that they've been summoned to an FMM without any federal dollars being put on the table or anything to discuss. So you'd have to assume they're willingly walking into a meeting where a number is going to be dropped on them. And they seem happy about that. I don't believe that. Paul Wells regularly reminds us that Trudeau gets put into situations when the deal is done, not put into situations to do the deal. So all that would lead me to believe that the deal's already baked, except for um, there's no leaked number that's come out of the, the provinces, and the feds insist they've put no number on the table. So how is this all uh, – somebody explain all this to me. How is this going to – how is this working? Well, they have put numbers on the table to provinces, but they've done it in a series of bilateral conversations. Um, at least they have with Ontario, and uh, and uh, uh, there are some other provinces. Like, and you know, it's not some great insider knowledge on that. It's being reported pretty widely uh, in the media that it's in the seventy-ish billion, seventy-plus billion, in, in the case of Ontario. Um, so, you know, I, th- I think there are clearly conversations that have been going on uh, with the provinces uh, around what this this looks like. Uh, you know, I think it's going to be some increment of new money uh, and and we'll see in you know what the total number is for all the provinces when added together. But, uh, you know, a significant uh, number, I think, is is what's in the cards, not anywhere near the the number that the provinces have been asking for. They've been asking for. Uh, the feds to pay a thirty-five percent share up from twenty-two. I don't that'd think it's going to come. That'd be a twenty-eight billion annually yeah. new money. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be anything. Uh, I don't think it's going to be anything close to that. But uh, nor do I think that that's a good. Uh, you know, g- going that full distance right away is is uh, advisable. Like I think there's a lot of things that need to happen in the healthcare system on the reform side before you you back up the dump truck full of uh, additional funding or you're just going to bid up wages within the existing system and you're not you're not going to see a lot uh of the change that you're you're hoping to get for that. So, you know, I I think it'll be an incremental uh, step forward. Um but I I don't think there's going to be a big back and forth. I don't think this is going to be a summit. My view is that the the prime minister and his ministers are going to come in, they're going to make a presentation as to to what this is and isn't. 
I think that will closely reflect what is already out in the public realm in terms of, of uh, conditions or strings attached to this. And which, then with uh, data sharing, you're talking about data sharing. Uh, well, data sharing, but also on some of the spending priorities like uh, like home care, like um, uh, long term care, like more money for uh, additional nursing positions, et cetera. But all of those things are really easy to say yes to. And I think in terms of data sharing, it's it's an easy yes from everyone who isn't being a total ideological jackass about it. So, you know, uh, insert uh, Alberta, uh, Saskatchewan and Quebec. Uh, I think everybody else uh, thinks more uh, additional data sharing is 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 actually really good, and especially if you're you know more on the conservative side of the ledger, uh, data sharing is uh, very conservative in my view. It's this is about trying to have some additional market signals within the system as to what's working and what isn't, and having some accountability around that. So, uh, I, I think it's it's the only way you don't come to that conclusion is saying healthcare is a provincial responsibility under the constitution, and you guys can go fuck off. But oh, oh by the way, still send me a big check. Uh, it's just not a, a reasonable position uh, in the view of of most voters, and and I think most folks in politics. So, uh, so I think they're going to present it, and I don't think there's going to be a lot of back and forth. I think it's going to be largely take it or leave it, and I think there'll be bilateral agreements, you know, hammered out between each of the province one one at a time, and. Uh, I so suspect, no chance of a failure. This thing's a baked-in success. Well, failure in that if somebody wants to say, I'm not taking the money, uh, that would be a failure for them. But I, I just I can't see in the environment that we're in right now uh, that anyone doesn't say yes. Like, you know, which premier is administering a healthcare system that's so robust and so perfect right now that they can say no to this kind of additional funding? I just I just don't think there's anything you can say other than thank you. Yeah. So, what would you say about a public policy that could result in up to 115,000 Canadian workers getting a chance to own the companies they work for, to share in the wealth building that, right now, goes to their owners, and that all this can be done without those employees having to pay for their ownership because the payment would come from the company's future profits? Sounds too good to be real? Well, this is a policy that already exists in the U.S. and U.K. hurley burleyites In the U.S., 14 million American workers currently share $1.7 trillion in wealth through a policy called employee ownership trusts. In the U.K., a record 300 businesses were sold to employees in 2021 alone. Some frontline workers have retired as millionaires because of it. Here in Canada, a majority of business owners are planning on selling their businesses over the next 10 years. Many of them would prefer to sell to the employees who made their businesses successful. But unlike the UK and the US, Canadian law and tax policies don't provide a simple way to do it. The Canadian government has committed to bringing employee ownership trust to this country, hopefully in this upcoming budget. If it happens, those 115,000 Canadian workers could accumulate collective personal wealth of almost $10 billion over eight years. It's a big opportunity, one that requires creating incentives through the tax system for owners to get a fair return in selling to employees and for all employees of a company to be able to participate in ownership. Those have been the keys to success in the U.S. and U.K. Without those incentives that government would get back in taxes over time, this policy will not work. The Canadian Employee Ownership Coalition, a network of business, nonprofit, and charity sector leaders, wants to unlock the massive potential of employee ownership here in Canada. Budget 2023 is the time to do it. To learn more, go to employee-ownership.ca. I think it's very managerial. Like we, we just spent some time beating up on the government on these other two files about what appear to be managerial. Um, problems. Um, you know, we often bitch and moan about the ability of this government to execute. I think this shows enormous managerial astuteness. I think it's, you know, this kind of Lego executive federalism, we have a very, very modest base, you know, um, we're going to give you a lot of cash through the CHST and on top of it, we're going to Lego, you know, a very mi minimal set of conditions that everybody can surely agree to, like some basic data collection and sharing. And we'll probably use institutions that exist already, like Kai High, that are largely insulated from political charge 
debates and that sort of stuff. And then on top of that, you Lego a bunch of bilateral deals that allow you to talk to a variety of specific concerns that people have, that various jurisdictions have, allows them to say that they tailored their federal monies to things that matter most to me here living in British Columbia or in Nova Scotia or wherever. I just think all of it's very astute and it de-risks a lot of this. It takes away from the classic executive federalism model of one big meeting where, you know, Brian Peckford uh, can hold you by the balls, uh, you know, or Danny Williams, not to pick on Newfoundland, you know, Danny Williams runs off or certainly in this certain, in, in, you know, you don't want, um, you know, Danielle Smith, uh, you don't want to turn it into a platform for her to, to be able to wage. You think about it, given what she, she's got an election in May, her whole thing is that Ottawa is fucking us and she doesn't have a hook to hang her hat on around this massive Fed Prov meeting. She doesn't. She's just going to take the money and go. And there won't really be any room but, for but her I think to that's say, smart. That, like, I, don't, don't you think that's smart? Like, I, I, if if I were her, I want to I want to fight about just transition. There's all yeah, kinds of I, things I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about healthcare like yeah but if yeah, i'm her i've also got like a bunch of you know i've got i've got a, a family raccoons running around in my head right so you know <laughs> you can't rely on like yes i agree with you but i think from her perspective she'd be like fed prof summit let's talk about whether or not that's an opportunity for me to put the boots to them so i just think there's a lot of managerial astuteness here in terms of the way they've gone about it this kind of lego executive federalism i think it's smart i think you know over time people will write papers about this and sort of look at it in contrast to previous uh, administrations and how they handled stuff and, you know, on child care, on this. I think the question is what the results are going to be. That's not a political question for the here and now. The one thing I would remind everybody, I guess, having been through these things are that you don't do this if we want to be really crass, right? You don't do this kind of deal. You don't do it um, to get credit because you're not going to be awarded credit, right? You don't do it to fix the problem because there's no real way to know whether you can fix the healthcare problem, right? What you do do is to m mitigate your vulnerability to the problem. And I think that once this is done, if the government's astute in the way as men, is if it's astute in this presentation um, as it has been in its managerial efforts up to, to now with constructing this, they won't overclaim, they'll be happy to accept that it's diminished the vulnerability and people, you know, still to this day, and this is my per, uh, personal peccadillo, they bitch and moan about, oh, remember Paul Martin is fixed for a generation. Well, kiss my ass. It was a fix for a generation, right? The truth of the matter was that it, other than you guys, Corey, having to say, all right, fine, then we'll extend the 6% escalator. It was politically, Fed prov wise, it was still waters for 10, 15, 20 years. And the challenges that were here uh, that are we're with now what do they have to do with they had to do with the natural strains in 2012 you know the you know the boomers well, started to, to to retire and that's placing enormous strain on all elements of our healthcare system well, well, before we get into healthcare, let me ask you this let's go to this leger poll let's go to this le uh, leger. why would i say leger let's go to this abacus poll that came out yeah. last week david coletto yeah uh, um and in addition to the top line number, which got a lot of attention, conservatives eight point lead, liberals twenty nine. Um, on the issue set, he found top of people's concern lists was climate. Oh, sorry, was Jesus? I'm out Jesus. of my mind today. Top of the list was economy, cost of living, healthcare. On all those things, the government was seen to be paying inadequate amount of attention to those issues. And it was over-indexed on some other issues that are of lesser importance to people, which relates back to our conversation about the anti-Islamophobia uh, position. Um, so how do you communicate what you've done here to try to give Canadian, more Canadians the impression that you were properly focused on the healthcare system? Yeah, well, like I, I think this is, I actually do think there's a win here for, for the government. Uh, but the endorsement of... Uh, provinces and the acceptance of the deal is, I think, where they get the 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 win. Uh, what Doug Ford has to say about it will be more important than what uh, uh, what uh, a, a, anyone else does. Like uh, you know, it's the the validation is going to be people who are perceived as being um, 
uh, outside of your organization and, and with, an, with an interest in this who are, yeah. are not on your side politically, generally speaking, if they're happy, well, then it's obviously a good deal. And so like, I, I think that, that's what's going to be the test of this. I think he, I think Trudeau's going to get some of that for a bunch of different reasons. Like I think, and some from some unlikely places. I think from Daniel Smith, for the reason we talked about. I think you know anyone who's a conservative politician going into an election campaign uh, is not interested in talking healthcare a lot, and I think they want to get off this topic and get back onto other things, and they want to fight with the federal government, but not on this particularly. So you know, I think that's what this is. You know, that, that, that's what that's where the win is for them. All right. Yeah, I, I, I agree. That's what I was saying. I think more or less is that you 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 do. By the way, I would add, I think Ford's been instrumental in this. Right. Like, you know, breaking the breaking the log jam in January, saying that he would agree to some uh, to spend the money on health and that he would agree to uh, data and that that opened the door fast. The other the other person who's going to matter and it hails back to what we were saying a moment ago. It's going to matter that Legault decides that he's no long that he will not try to use health care as a bat against the federal government. Post this deal, the likelihood of that is lower, much lower. The likelihood of him trying is much lower and the likelihood of him succeeding is much lower. So you take a look at those top three issues. If you can't win them, you at least don't want to lose them. And I think this week is about making certain that they they don't lose on health care. Can, can I point out one other thing that I think is very clever about how the government has approached this? The timing, the timing of when they're doing it in terms of the, the budget cycle uh, there is going to be big pressure on provinces to say yes quickly uh, and uh, be able to have f uh, funding that they're putting into their provincial budgets, which are all being put to bed right now, uh, to say yes and be able to uh, match some of those funds that will be in this agreement uh, and and put that cash infusion into their healthcare system. But to to you know book that money in their provincial budget budget coming up they basically have to say yes almost immediately if they want to do that so like i think i think it's sort of jamming the the uh uh the provinces uh in, in that way a little bit but in a in i think a very clever way interesting all right gordon bring it home for us brother ladies and gentlemen please return to your seats the hey yous are about to begin all right who's got a hey you well, I'm, I'm happy to go. Uh, I kind of tipped my hand a little bit. My hey you is to Pablo Rodriguez. Uh, I think Quebec uh, is going to be a big part of this next election, and I think it's an essential uh, area for the, the Liberals to, to, to do well at. And so if you're going to have the title Quebec lieutenant, you better fucking show up and do your job. And if you do not know what's going on with things like this appointment this past week, then uh, there's something very broken, or you're not putting the amount of focus on on your on your role as you need to. So uh, time to pull up your socks if you don't want to be the last Quebec lieutenant in the Trudeau government. There you go. Scott? Um, I've got a hat trick. Hey, you. Um, I'm going to pick up on this uh, ridiculous Fox News Tucker Carlson thing where he says that he's going to use like armed force to liberate Canada from Trudeau. Okay. Wank off by Tucker Carlson, who wanks off as, you know, for a living. Um, my objection is this. My hey, you goes, first of all, to Tucker Carlson, go fuck yourself, okay? We, like, we don't need you talking about us. You're, you're just, you're... You're worse than most of those creatures because you realize, you know full well you pedal shit, but you just like cynically do it in order to line your pocket. You're just, you're, you're an absolute cancer. Second is the NDP member that said, let's, let's, let's move the motion in the House. So then we reward this tool by talking about him in, in Parliament, knowing that it's probably not going to get a unanimous consent. So, like, don't start that when you know it's not going to go. And then finally. What, what, our, why not? What about Quebec's powerful unanimous resolutions of the National Assembly that they throw out? 
Yeah, well, but they're unanimous. This wasn't. So, <laughs> and then the, <laughs> my, the third leg of my uh, hey you stool goes to you know whatever the anonymous conservative MPs who scream no uh, in the request for unanimous consent. Uh, if you can't sign on to say let's let's let even if we think it's a ridiculous thing, if you can't sign on to say actually that guy shouldn't say that he's going to attack Canada, uh, then then you're lame. So the whole <laughs> fucking thing is just a great big giant stew of shit, and they all. Just Deserve to be called out. Here, here. All right. Here, here. Agree with that. Uh, my hey, you goes out to the Trudeau government. Don't be cavalier about your current situation. Uh, despite what you think, you are the underdogs going into the next election. Don't think that it's early in the mandate and you have time to fix everything politically before the next election. Any liberal number that starts with a two is cause for alarm. Lots of governments are effectively dead long before the election arrives. Canadians want you to be focused on the economy, the cost of living and health care. The upcoming health accord and a budget allow you to do that. Do it. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everybody who watched or listened today. I'd like to thank you guys for being here. Look forward to Jordan being back next week. I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, our sponsor, CN, the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, and Canadian Employee Ownership Coalition. So thanks, everybody, for being here. We'll be back next week with more Curse of Politics and Jordan Leichnitz. See you then.